Sam Altman won't tell you that GPT-4 has 220 billion parameters and is a 16-way mixture model with eight sets of weights? Who, who did you have to murder to get that information? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I mean, but, look, but yes. everyone at OpenAI knows what I just said was true. Hello, friends. Welcome to AI Flux. So last night, I made the mistake of leaving my phone too close to where I was sleeping, and I woke up when a friend of mine forwarded me a tweet that basically said verbatim, GPT-4's details are leaked, it's over, everything is here. And I opened it up and it looked like it was actually pretty realistic, uh, but it reminded me of a few things I had read over before from some papers and some other sources that I've used for the channel. So who did this information come from? This information came from Jan Peleg. He's a researcher at Anthropic, and uh, generally I, I think you should follow him on Twitter if you're into AI stuff. What's interesting is this tweet very quickly, within like an hour or two of it being released, was taken down on Twitter, uh, supposedly for copyright reasons. Until recently, we didn't really know why that was, and this still hasn't been confirmed, but we have some good guesses. Nonetheless, Jan Peleg was one of the bigger voices in validating George Hotz's breakdown of how he thought GPT-3 or GPT-3.5 was architected. So let's carefully go through a archive version of this tweet and break down why I think this is probably a pretty good guess, both in terms of how it's actually put together and how much it probably costs to run and train GPT-4. So this is the archive tweet. As you can see, this was published about last night around 11.30. And there are a lot of interesting details here. So first off, there's the parameters count. This has been something that's been a highly debated topic, both from OpenAI contributors and people who just work in the space generally. The consensus at this point is that more parameters past a certain point doesn't give you that much of a performance gain. But here, Yam is saying that GPT-4 is most likely 10 times the size of GPT-3. This is different than prior claims that claimed, oh, GPT-4 is a thousand times larger than GPT-3. And they say that we believe it has a total of 1.8 trillion parameters across 120 layers. Mixture of experts is confirmed. So mixture of experts is basically how OpenAI has managed to make GPT-3.5 and GPT-4 specifically so capable in a generalized sense. The idea here is you have a lot of small models that are good at specific things, and then you kind of do a really good job of routing information through those. So this is why we see um, beta plugins or, or beta features like Code Interpreter, which is basically one of these expert models that only focuses on coding. And generally, if you're just feeding something into GPT-4, if it thinks that you're saying something about coding, it will provide that input to the coding model and then route the output. So what they say here is OpenAI was able to keep cost reasonable by utilizing a mixture of experts or a MOE model, which utilizes 16 experts within their model, each is about 111 billion parameters for MLP2. Two of these exports are routed per forward pass. So again, there's a routing factor here that's kind of interesting. And MOE is something I wanna cover in just a bit because I've read about this in papers before, and this is also an approach that Meta has used. So what is MOE routing? And this becomes an infrastructure question because Routing uh, implies you're actually pushing information between multiple GPUs that might be thinking about a single inference path or a single input from a user um, applying against inference and then producing an output. So basically here, Yam is saying that while the literature talks about advanced routing algorithms for choosing which experts to route to based on tokens, so basically if you know what the input is and how good you are at that, a lot of the sauce really becomes more routing than the AI itself. He's saying here that OpenAI is allegedly quite simple for the current GPT-4 model. There are roughly 55 billion shared parameters for attention. So basically those are parameters that are shared among all experts. Now the next factor here is inference. So each forward pass inference or the generation of one token only utilizes 280 billion parameters and around 560 teraflops. Teraflops is a, a way to equate uh, how much GPU compute one inference pass takes. This, con this contrasts with the 1.8 trillion parameters and the 3,700 teraflops that would be required per forward pass of a purely dense model. So that's basically saying roughly, if you combined all of the experts into one model, then you need way more com computational power to do anything with this. Now, the data set. So what we're starting with before we even have the model. Uh, so GPT-4 is supposedly trained on about 13 trillion tokens. They're not unique 
but they count the epochs as more tokens as well. Epoch two, uh, two epochs for text-based data and four for code-based data. So basically saying that code-based data is more dense and takes a little bit more time to interpret properly. There are millions of rows of instruction fine-tuning data from Scale AI internally. So basically this is cheating to understand um, a little bit more of what's going on. And for those of you who don't know, Scale AI basically sells uh, kind of a MechTurk powered uh, data set that can allow you to sort of uh, leapfrog over issues in your models and patch them sort of with drywall mud, if you will. So GPT-4, 32K. 32K refers to the context length. So there was an 8K context length uh, for the pre-training phase. The 32K version of GPT-4 is based on fine tuning of the 8K after pre-training. So training is not a single step. There is a lot of kind of fine tuning this model and getting it into kind of where it is now, which is why sometimes GPT-4 maybe didn't feel as good as it does now and why it's sometimes slow. Because Now, batch size. Uh, so batch size was supposedly gradually ramped up over a number of days on the cluster, but by the end, OpenAI was using a batch size of 60 million, which is crazy. This, of course, is only a batch size of 7.5 million tokens per expert since every expert can't see every token. And again, this is when that routing algorithm to understand which expert to apply to an input really matters. Now, for the real batch size, we have to divide this number by the sequential length to get the real batch size. The numbers have been misleading prior, and I think this is one of the better guesses I've seen. Now, everyone who's read about transformers, which is what has kind of caused this big burst of AI progress, knows that one of the bigger uh, implications of transformers is you can run them uh, in parallel and you get near linear scaling. So this is why the H100 is seemingly so wildly fast compared to uh, any generation of NVIDIA GPUs before it. And it's because GPU parallelism works because transformer parallelism works. So to parallelize across all their A100 GPUs at the time, they utilize an eight way tensor parallelism that is the limit for NVLink. So this is a very, very solid assumption. So again, you can only Parallelize eight-way tensors across an NVLink bus. Beyond that, they're using a 15-way pipeline parallel. So now for the training cost, how much did it cost OpenAI to actually create this? So the number of flops that was required to train GPT-4 is kind of insane. A flop is a measure of computational power. And what's crazy is to train all of GPT-4 that took um, 25 quintillion flops of compute. So that's 25,000 A100s running for 90 to 100 days, which is kind of nuts. Granted, uh, a pretty low utilization, actually. And the reason why that is, is because sometimes checkpoints fail. So you can't assume the model will just perfectly run at 100% uptime for 90 days. Pretty inefficient, actually, and really, uh, you know, pretty surprising. So the next bit is the cloud cost. So if they didn't have these GPUs and they were renting them, let's assume, you know, right now on Lambda, an A100 is about a dollar per hour and assuming scale and time differences here, a dollar per hour is a pretty good assumption. So the training cost for the run alone would have been $63 million, which I know sounds like a lot of money, but actually that's an amount that if you could palpably justify to a VC, they would probably give you. And one of the best insights here for me is the comparison of that to H100s. So curiously, today the pre-training could be done with just 8,200 H100s in around 55 days for only 25 million, even assuming that these GPUs are twice as expensive to rent. So basically a third of the cost and yeah, probably less energy as well. I don't know if it actually worked more effectively, but interesting enough to see. And curiously, that's about it. That's That was the end of this thread. And for some reason, either OpenAI, more likely uh, a blog we've used as a source here, thought this was some kind of egregious copyright leak. Just to give attribution, uh, the source that people think this is, is a blog called Semi-Analysis. So Semi-Analysis, again, I'm giving credit to this. Uh, I, these insights are very interesting. They're linked below. Please subscribe to their Substack if you can afford it. Yeah, so basically they had a post on July 10th as well that seemingly outline some very similar assumptions. And I'm not going to get into it here. In my opinion, their focus in this article was a little bit different. They were more kind of hardware based and more extrapolating um, a cost basis for this. And of course, semi-analysis is expensive. And I think this might have been handled a little weird. Another thing that I think is kind of interesting is this paper called 
mixture of experts meets instruction tuning, a winning combination for large language models. What I find interesting here is there's a lot of insight that can be drawn from this relative to how GPT-4 is actually set up. So again, they refer to this uh, sparse mixture of experts model, which is not exactly a novel suggestion to how to run these models and scale them. So what they refer to this as is that the design can be utilized to add learning parameters to large language models without increasing inference cost. And right now for OpenAI, their biggest bottom line is GPU time and this increasing inference cost. I'm not gonna get too far into this, but the biggest thing with the bets that OpenAI makes both technically and financially, and those two are very closely linked, is what will we gain from running more GPU time to gain inference cost, right? What do we gain from that? How much is reasonable? So if we add these parameters, we make these models bigger, do they actually even get better? And more importantly, what are users actually paying for? And I'm making another video about this, but there is a very valid question to ask, which is, did some uh, tuning decision within this kind of decision matrix lead to a drop off in people using G People have maybe stopped using GPT-4 for a number of reasons, and you should watch our video about this that's coming out very soon about this very topic. But there's a very valid question that's, you know, maybe they were too conservative with their uh, inference costs. Maybe they thought the gains wouldn't really be that great and they focused on fine tuning elsewhere. I would argue that they've probably decided to focus on code interpreter, which I think by far is the most, which for me, in my opinion, as a user of GPT-4 myself and a software engineer, I think if I was a, pr a prospective customer or someone who was going to buy say six licenses or more of GPT-4, Code Interpreter is the biggest win hands down. So it makes sense you'd focus on maybe more fine tuning that than making the model more general because making the model more general isn't necessarily a win-win in terms of giving everyone a value add who's using it. And maybe lots of people using GPT-4 just stop seeing as much of a value add. So <laughs> some really interesting information today. Uh, as always, if you like this video or you learned something, please like and subscribe. Again, check out some of the analysis. I, I'm going to give them credit for these insights. And as always, uh, we'll see you in the next video.